We're Supergrass. Guitar, bass, and drums is what we are. A bit of ivory. They are about something that so few British bands are about at the moment. Putting the record on before you go out on a Saturday night and actually jumping about the room, actually feeling this is what pop music is about. So in a way, it's a kind of pop classicism. It's, it's classic rock music. For six years, Supergrass have been pumping on the nation's stereo with some of the best pop music in the business. They've become a British institution. <laughs> Supergrass burst onto the pop scene in a haze of three-minute summer hits in 1995. But while some so-called Britpoppers have fallen by the wayside, today Supergrass have three classic albums to their name and have grown from cartoon characters to real-life million-selling rock stars. In 1995, grunge was dying. Something had to kick-start the party again. The new wave was Britpop, and Supergrass just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Supergrass arrived when Britpop was at its peak, but while Oasis and Blur outposed each other, Supergrass were just being themselves and having a laugh. I think looking back on the whole Britpop period, it's, it's kind of interesting to see sort of how Supergrass dealt with it. Britpop never heard of it. They were just going about being Supergrass, and whatever they did seemed exactly right for that period of time. And that was perfect then, and then became a hindrance later. I don't think any band would say, yes, we are Britpop, you know what I mean? A few, any, any a few of them did, maybe, but yeah. Yeah, because Diamond said that Britpop was dead, didn't it? So it must have had some sort of vested interest in it. I just always thought we were a rock and roll band, really. That's what I say to taxi drivers when they say, oh, what do you do then? You know, I just sort of say I'm in a rock and roll. front of Brit, Because it's, <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't just their catchy pop tunes that people bought into. I feel quite, uh, <clears throat> feel quite laid back. They just got out of bed look and Gaz's overgrown sideburns swept them into the nation's pop consciousness. <laughs> Big chicken, eh? One of the odd things about Supergrass is the whole image thing, because in many ways they seem sort of image-less. As far as, like, clothes go, I don't know, it's like you just, uh, I tend to just wake up in the morning and put on uh, whatever's lying next to the bed. They seem to embody in their videos and in their lyrics and in their music a sort of quintessential Englishness as well. But it's not there in the way they dress. They don't sort of force it. Everyone used to take the piss in school and say, look at that guy over there, he's got sideburns. It's not a statement, basically. It's just bits of hair. <laughs> but even in their early teens, the boys had that special something that girls just couldn't resist. I used to see Danny in the, the pub sometimes, and I thought he was a, a, a bit of an ugly bugger, really, sometimes. Although, obviously, he looks better now, but... He always used to be surrounded by, by girls, and I couldn't understand it, especially because like, he used to dress very um, 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 like, effeminately as well. And I just couldn't understand how he had all these girls around him. It was crazy. The Supergrass story began in 1993 when frontman Gaz and drummer Danny formed a band called the Jennifers. They met whilst washing dishes in an Oxford pub. Like, even when Gaz was flipping burgers at the harvester or whatever, I still think he was a rock star flipping burgers at the harvester. Yeah. 
The boys then met bassist Mickey Quinn and Supergrass was born. With the new lineup, Polyphone Records couldn't resist their unique sound and signed them up. Their big break had come. Almost from the start, I mean, there was such a leap up from the Jennifers. Um, you know, first gig, you could see, you know, it's like, wow, this is great. And this is, you know, this was before Britpop, Supergrass, but obviously this much bigger, more exciting beast. Soon they were in a recording studio, a handful of songs, and what came out of it was one of the rawest, freshest albums to hit the music scene. The story about Gaz getting done by the police. And we, all, we were all in a car and it got stopped by the police and uh, we all got searched and Gaz's little tin fell down his trousers and onto the floor and the police were like that. In these early sessions, the band created a song that became the soundtrack to the summer of 1995. Dom and I sort of sat down and sort of tried to create a real image. And we were kind of like playing on the song All Right, which had this kind of really super cheesy sort of piano, honky-tonk piano, and um, the real naive, youthful lyrics, we are young, we run green. So we just took that and like pushed it. We took that and pushed it so much that it created this like really big sort of impact with them in like red, white and blue with their names, flying along beds and chopper bikes and stuff. Really simple song, it's just two chords basically and the, the verses and yeah, it just captures some sort of energy and youthfulness and, I don't know, which was probably lacking around, you know, songs in the charts around that time. There was a lot of kind of grunge music and stuff like that and it's it's just kind of a fresh song. But no one really got it. I mean alright, there's a great bit in alright if you watch the video where um, Gaz is sitting on the sofa and Danny and Mick pop up from behind. And um, if you actually watch Danny when he pops up from behind, he looks straight down the lens and he says, fuck off. We recorded that and we, weren't, we didn't really think it was going to be a single. We just, it's a bit of a cheesy song to be honest. Mums and kids were coming in the street sort of saying, oh, my daughter loves it, and she's only about three. Old grannies were coming up and saying, oh, I was young. I just totally went to a different market. But all this monkeying around didn't just do great things for the band at home. It attracted the attention of one of the biggest star makers in the world. Steven Spielberg got to see that video and ended up kind of... Uh, wanted to make a TV series with them, I think based on the characters that he kind of saw in that video, which was just wasn't them really. And they're presented as a very cartoon band. Their videos were very cartoon. They, you know, they looked very cute, you know, sort of Danny and Gaz are very sort of, you know, cute photogenic faces. So if you have an American director who wants to kind of get back to that kind of, no, that feeling of the monkeys, of an, you know, kind of American stepping into a world of British music and redoing it, then Supergrass at the time seemed like the perfect band. And all right, they didn't actually play any instruments, so people kind of thought they were just like a boy band or something who didn't actually play their own instruments and write their own songs. The band realised they'd been caught by their own fuzzy image, so turned down Spielberg to concentrate on what they were really about. There were more than choppers, space hoppers and Britpop. It had always been about the music. It's late. In the afterglow of success, the band knew they had to change or be forever thought of as Britpop casualties. What came next was the darker sound of three boys who were about to give the finger to their cartoon character image.
Gaz, the personality, is, is very shy. Mick is very quiet and deep. And Danny is the kind of joker in the band, really. You know, we were in a position where we can sort of live quite fast and stuff, but um, I don't because I'm far too boring. Boys, stop messing about back there, OK? I think Mick's less shallow than Danny and Gaz, and sort of, so he sort of understands that it doesn't really mean anything. It's much more important things in life than fame. Uh, we've got the toilet down here. This is where people go to have a piss. This is a steering wheel. This is how the driver drives the bus. Ah! Oh, Danny, oh, yeah. sorry. We don't actually like each other very much. It's all one big facade. We're getting really good at sort of, like... Just... You're right, mate. Yeah. Watch this, look. It's great to see you. It's <coughs> it's so hard to do, do you know what I mean? Steven Spielberg wanted Supergrass to be his new monkeys, but the band rejected the million dollar offer. They had come dangerously close to being stereotyped. It was time to move on. What you had was a band who were going through that period where they didn't want to be seen as a commodity, they didn't want to be seen as a product or a tin of beans. And in many ways it's similar to what the Monkees were doing in 1968 when they made the film Head. And there's a song on that Monkees album that says, Hey, hey, we are the Monkees, you know we like to please, a standardised commodity with no philosophies. And it's almost exactly, very, very similar to the lyrics of Supergrass is in it for the money. In their haste to get away from the cheeky, chappy, all-British image, the band had gone the other way. We did sort of look at In It For The Money when we finished it and thought maybe we'd gone a bit too dark and stuff. But, um, you know, we didn't want to go straight back and remake Ash and Coco. Video for Richard the Third, that as well was really good. Just wanted to get a real sort of paranoid sort of like vibe to it. You know, you're in a little room and you're kind of claustrophobic and you know, you got to get out and, and just kind of that real tense kind of atmosphere, which is, you know, what the song is about. It starts with a Mexican standoff between yeah. Mick and Gats where they're just staring each other out and it kind of suddenly creates a little bit of tension, whereas Supergrass before had always been like, you know, hey! Well, so there's a bit where um, you know Mick, Mick goes to do a runner out of the door and then Danny pulls his guitar lead and sort of pulls him on the floor. Yeah. That was kind of all been mean to each other. But In It For The Money wasn't without its humorous moments. Going out was a satirical look at the state of celebrity. I really liked the video for that, yeah. We went to um, Battersea Park and the bandstand there. It was really good, it was a good video. It was a really cold day, but we got these massive, big, like, army jackets and big scarves and stuff. Um, just, we wanted a good performance video, really. It was just a kind of rock and roll song. They are really fundamentally quite funny. The newspaper headlines are going out. Yeah. Supergrass eat roast dinners. It's like sort of like, it's just like pointless. And there's, uh, yeah, there's a fight of uh, Gaz oh, yeah. and Ronnie Biggs on yeah. Rob's keyboard that we sort of ran across. It's like Gaz and Ronnie Biggs. Supergrass are frequently perceived as a three-piece but always lurking in the background is Gaz's brother, the camera-shy keyboardist Rob. Rob doesn't do any problem because he absolutely hates it. He's very, very shy. He's a lovely guy, but he's very, very shy. It's not that he doesn't like it, he's just not allowed to. Yeah. He he's said you can be in the speech. band, Rob, he's got a speech but, um, impediment. Whenever he talks, he goes... <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be really embarrassing if he ever asked so many questions. I never really intended to be in a band. I just sort of, I fell into the band, really, because of Gaz being my brother. It was kind of like bring your mate in and, and make him learn piano instead of bring someone you can play piano in and hope that you can be your mate, you know. Oh, you're a lively bunch. The band's third album saw them getting the balance between the first two just right, and pumping on your stereo was the band back on classic supergrass form. I 
know, it's quite a different this record. I mean, we run out of songs by the time we came to record it. Because I mean, for the for the I should Coco, you get you know the first 20 years of your life to write a record, and then in it for the money was probably a bit of you know the stuff left over from I should Coco more or less. So we had to start from scratch. <laughs> It's probably a little bit more light than it for the moment. You know, we're not a massively deep band, really. We sort of we're quite sort of, you know, we don't really sort of get into being really deep about our songs. I do. Well. <laughs> I mean, for me personally, it's probably the most pathetic track on the album in terms of, you know, actual songwriting or ability or uh, sort of originality. Um, but it's, it's probably the most the one that makes you want to swing your pants the most. We did the video for it with Garth Jennings, and it was basically his idea to use the puppets. So we went for that, and then, then we found out later on that it had been around and rung around all the puppeteers to see who could do it, and then Jim Henson workshop came up and they said they, they were really into doing it, so, you know, it's an extra plus sign and, and we really went for it. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't total giggles making it, but it was quite funny, especially knocking Danny's head off, which was really good fun. <laughs> that was my pet favourite bit. No, it's just really mad, it's a really mad idea. It's really weird. Strangely enough, it's the first video that we've actually scripted ourselves. So it gives you some insight into how dark our minds are, which is probably not that dark, but it's pretty, it's not that nice having your mum vomit all over you. I was quite surprised that it got banned outright. I mean, it's, there's nothing gratuitously violent or um, really bad in that. I mean, there's, there's stuff that's vaguely verging on sick, but uh, it was more funny than anything else. It's just a lot of blood for no apparent reason and um, somebody throwing up lots of chocolate milk and that's about as bad as it gets. But having said that, I probably wouldn't play it to my daughter. <laughs> now, the rest of the world have caught on to the Supergrass sound, resulting in worldwide tours playing to thousands of people. Just flew over the beautiful coastline, it's very serene, lovely kind of lapping waters against the shores. here in the land of New Zealand. Last night I was in Christchurch playing the drums for a really crappy kind of student gig, which was really dull. Um, and I hadn't had hardly any sleep, so I was reserving on um, energy that I keep in my bottom. It's like, it's like a camel in its humps. Yeah. Everyone's been quite appreciative of us actually coming here because we've done a few gigs around New Zealand, so you know, bands don't usually come to Wellington and, and stuff like that, so everyone sort of makes an effort to be friendly. And... in-store signing sessions, which tend to play havoc with my psyche. I you know, know it's action. really kind of embarrassing. You're just writing kind of this little swiggle over some little girls. It's only because you never did it, though, you know. What? It's only because you never did it, really. What? Ask, ask anyone for an autograph. Yeah, I, I just I find do... it a little bit strange, and it kind of is really unsettling, isn't it? Yeah. 
One of the things that you noticed on tour was that they do have this incredibly strong sort of family unit. And I think with other bands, that would kind of smack of nepotism. You'd think, so what's going on there? It's jobs for the boys. But with Supercrass, it is kind of like it works as an extended family. And if it adds to the sort of special feel, then that's really important. A bit more than anything, we just love being on stage. I mean, it's love good. going mental. I think it's quite easy for the sort of crowd to sort of sense if you're sort of running through the motions or if you're just a bit kind of knackered or a bit bored and stuff. From English eccentrics to worldwide superstars, Supergrass have proven that you can be the boys next door and take on the world. Supergrass is maybe a little bit rock and roll, but not. Terribly. No, they don't throw TVs out of windows and stuff like that, you know, they're just nice guys. They look like a beer after a gig like anyone else, nothing excessive. They're a bit bigger and they're a bit more rich. They've got bigger houses, but apart from that, they're pretty much the same. We've kept a pretty level head. <laughs> Just from friends and you know family and stuff like that. And I think we're quite conscious not to be like a real arrogant tossers. 